yeah, man, you heard right. Outside got a mainstream exterior. Inside has my true love for material. Wow. How about that intro? <laughs> so, uh... Don't pretend like you don't have a picture like this somewhere. You just kept it better hidden. And good for you now, I realize. But I'm a nerd. And I know that because I was called one in second grade. As early as second grade, yeah, believe it or not. Um, and it wasn't something that I sought out, and it wasn't something that I tried to set myself apart from. It was just the label that I was assigned, and, and it stuck, and that was, that was okay. And then about fifth grade, I realized that uh, nerd wasn't really a term of endearment. And it actually comes with a lot of unfortunate side effects, like having your ears flicked by the kids behind you on the bus and, and having those books knocked out of your hand once you get to school and getting punched in the eye for some imagined offense. Like, I just like Star Wars a lot. <sighs> but this isn't a story about bullying. Because I, what I realized early on is that it's really hard to be victimized when you own that identity. Really takes the wind out of a bully's sails when the taunt is, nerd! And you go, yeah, <laughs> right, sure I am. And so what I want to talk to you today is about really celebrating that identity. And I do, truly, because I'm a nerd, I love nerd culture, and as, uh, as they mentioned, uh, for the past year and a half, I've been writing my master's thesis on nerds and nerd culture. So if you're keeping score at home, I'm a nerd studying nerds, <laughs> like in Roboros, except with glasses, pocket protector, little bow tie. And what I've realized is that my story isn't really unique. I mean, nerds are just part of a long tradition of othering. The nerd, among other others, is the marginalized subset of a society's hegemonic ideal. Let me take that out of like grad speak and tell you that there's always a popular culture. There always has been, there always will. And in order for a popular culture to define itself, there has to be an other in opposition to it. And nerds occupy that space. And the nerd experience, the nerd identity that we understand now is really rooted in, um, at least in Western culture, the idea of um, discourses, 19th century discourses on immigration from the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense because it was a time of westward expansion and it was a time of America sort of flirting with that idea of, of dipping their toes in the water and, and really realizing their position as a burgeoning superpower. And so there was an ideal form of what American should be, and it was hyper-masculine, and it was, you know, uber-competitive, and it was all about bending nature to your will, and, and, you know, if necessary, going out in the woods and wrestling a cougar like Teddy Roosevelt would do, because that's what America was all about. And if you weren't, if you weren't that, if you don't like to wrestle cougars, that's okay, but you were othered, if you were European, if you were from a different religious background, if you were just bookish, you were put into a different category, and you were othered, and you were hidden away from society. And that went on, that went on you know, throughout the century. In the 1950s, with the rise of youth culture, there was the rise of the nerd identity, and of course, it was best personified in the 1980s because you had John Hughes movies, and you had the modern American classic, Revenge of the Nerds. It's not Citizen Kane, but it's pretty good, filmed in Tucson. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, the nerd experience has always been there, but what's cool is there was a nerd culture that came out of that. And it was a, it was a culture of intense fandom and, and intellectualism and, and speculative storytelling and tinkering with technology and the pride and collection of esoteric knowledge and sharing that. And what it did is it gave this, this, this new tribe a place where they could practice their identity. It gave them somewhere safe where they could be free from judgment and persecution and, and these immense worlds that they can colonize with their mind. It was an amazing place. And so nerd culture, and it's been going on for years, like I said, but really in any generation, nerd culture serves as a place for a collective identity based on shared touch points between similarly stigmatized members. Grad speak again, sorry about that. It'll be about the last time because that's the end of our history lesson. That's where we've been. And now what's happening is there's something really interesting happening. 
Because up until just a few years ago, nerddom was a joke, right? Like we all cheered for Napoleon Dynamite, that epic dance sequence with Jamiroquai, right? But we were still laughing at him, right? And you know the standard trope, the, the, the beautiful all along syndrome, where at the end of the movie, the, girl, the gal pal and the girl next door, at the end of the movie, she shakes out her hair and she takes off her glasses and we realize, oh my gosh, it's her. She's the one to be desired. But we just didn't notice her, but she's been beautiful all along. Because nerddom is made safe when it's play acted. And nerdom is made safe when it's just tried on just for a little bit. But it's never, never the preferable position when compared against the ideal. But now things are changing again. The lines are getting blurred because maybe chalk it up to mobile technology where we can access information at the touch of our fingertips and information on the most arcane subject matter we can become instant experts on because of technology. Intellectualism is now put on a pedestal, and geek is chic, and, and niche interests are now big business. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, Huey Lewis was right. It's hip to be square. <laughs> and that's good, right? Like, we won. We're popular now. We can sit at the cool table without being persecuted. Yes! <sighs> but no. Because there's something else coming out of nerd culture, and it's not great. Because there's a lot of resistance happening, and there's a lot of barriers going up, and there's a lot of people being scrutinized, a lot of people who just have always identified with that nerd identity are, are now being looked down upon and made to prove their position. There's, there, there, there's people that, that are just being othered in another way by their own culture. Geek cred, which was always about playful one-upmanship, how much do you know about the Star Wars extended universe? There, there are people that can you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that. And that was geek cred, and it was playful, and it was, it was fun. And now it's a tool used to weed out others that don't fit that nerd stereotype, that hacky portrayal that we've been fed for years and that some people still subscribe to. There are people out there right now that still desire that marginalized status, that they want to be victimized. And there's a really interesting debate going on right now about the fake nerd girl and about whether young, attractive females who have genuinely nerdy passions are being authentic or if they're just performing for male attention. And it's unfortunate because I'm a nerd. I've been a nerd for a while. Now I'm studying nerds. It's, I just started to realize that that wasn't my culture. A culture that was based on being excluded. Now when we're faced with assimilation, now we're excluding people, now we're online bullying and, and going into misogyny? Like, this is not right. And this is, I just figured there had to be a better way. Because for better or worse, for whatever reason, everyone's a nerd for something. And that's something that we should celebrate. We shouldn't set up parameters for nerddom. We should revel in nerdery in all of its forms. And that was the impetus for what later became the PBS nerd walk at ASU Homecoming. And I work at PBS, and we're probably the nerdiest channel on the dial <laughs> because we show the chemical process of making the perfect creme brulee in your kitchen, and then we show a documentary about string theory and cosmology, and then Antiques Roadshow because you can't eliminate the road show. So we're nerdy, and we're okay with that. And so what we did is we started copping to that nerddom. We said, hey, we're nerds, <laughs> and that's okay, and it's cool to be smart, and it's cool to like things. And if you're nerdy, that's great. Come out and join us, and we'll do something fun together, I promise. And so we figured that some people would come and join us, but we had no idea how much the idea would resonate. I like to call this picture, good luck taking our lunch money now. <laughs> because when we finally did get together and we finally assembled our nerds, we had about 500 people that wanted to show up and participate. 500 people that wanted to come out on a Saturday morning and march through the streets of Tempe and say, we're nerds. 
And it just became obvious that the time was right for something like this, for, for a couple reasons. One, because, you know, Comic Cons and places that are nerd safe where it's okay to geek out and it's, you can still protect that identity, there's still a perceived barrier of entry. Like, you might be a super fan for Superman, but if you don't know every iota of the character's 75-year history, you might be intimidated by talking about it with other people. And the Nerdwalk minimized this because it brought people out in a non-specific way, and that non-specificity became non-threatening. It was fun. And it, you know what? It's fun to embrace the stereotype sometimes. Like, a bunch of nerds culture jamming a, 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 an ASU event, you know, full of frat houses and football players. That's just fun. Some people got really excited over it. <laughs> but you know what? That's okay, too, because enthusiasm is infectious. Because you don't need permission to geek out. Like, go forth and nerd out. If that's your thing, do it. Awesome. But sometimes it's just easier when there are other people involved. And nerdery is, is inspiring because there's so many people that have so many intense passions about everything. And you can connect with those people and learn about what makes them tick because nerd culture is wide and deep. So much is paid to pop culture nerdery like Doctor Who or the latest Marvel movie. But you know what, somewhere out there right now, someone, maybe someone in this crowd, their key passion, the thing that keeps them up at night is documenting the perfect angle of a pretzel twist or something like that, just something crazy, and that is amazing. Like, I love that. And then there's the, also the idea of kids. Because kids today are still being called nerds. And they're not being called nerds for a good reason. They're maybe not for their niche interests, but just for genuinely being different by dressing weird or, or not playing sports or any sort of bullying that supports that schoolyard caste system. And that's not okay. What is okay is when these kids get to come out and see grown men and women unabashedly practicing their passions and getting really excited and saying, yes, I am a nerd. And that's okay because it's cool to like things. And they're doing it in public. They're doing it where other people can see them. And kids today, they can look at that and they can say, you know what, I'm not different. It's okay. And it's something to aspire to and things, things are going to get better for me. I know it. And this isn't to say that I don't understand the debate. I do. Because the nerd identity has an emotional resonance. So there is some defensive positioning and that's, that's valid, sure. Because to hold on to something for so many years that's literally been earned through blood, sweat, and tears and then to, that perception that you have to surrender it to mainstream culture, it's problematic. I get it. I get it. I do. But here's another idea. Rather than setting up barriers and, and rather than having the idea that now that it's mainstream, we have to somehow surrender ourselves, let's extend ourselves into what that can be. Rather than thinking that we're losing control or giving up, I'd argue that we're not. I'd argue that this generation of nerds, by being open and, and giving and sharing, can imbue the next generation of what nerdiness is with our own unique DNA. But we have to share. We can't get so protective for it. Because ultimately, by making the whole situation additive, by, by making nerd culture open source, if you will, I think we can provide something positive for the next generation. And of course, the next generation, because I can't go 10 minutes without talking about Star Trek. Thank you very much.